several cities have been working for years to bring light rail transit to the Northwest Metro, but the road has been long and frustrating. The Metropolitan Council had a meeting on Tuesday in Brooklyn Park to discuss what's next, and local officials showed up in full force to talk about light rail. Reporter Meredith Hackler was there too and filed this report. We've been working on this for well over 20 years. 20 years and counting. That's how long the Met Council along with local city governments have been talking about expanding the blue line. Well, there has been some progress. We had some questions about the support of the Met Council, quite frankly, for, for the current plan, and we heard loud and clear that they do support it, and that's great news. So it was also great just to re-energize everybody about all the work we've done over the past 10 years to bring this line to 90% engineered and really ready to go. There still hasn't been a lot of movement in the year of 2019. We need to move things forward because it's been at a standstill for too long. And that reason alone is why local and state representatives showed up in numbers to Tuesday's Met Council meeting in Brooklyn Park. All that support for a public project is pretty significant. And, you know, I think it's going to be key this meeting to kind of take it to the next level. I feel like we've been in cruise control for a little bit and hopefully today we can step on the gas pedal and uh, get things moving. And people at the local and state level are trying. However, there's been a significant roadblock when it comes to negotiations with the railroad. They have control of their lines and the and the unfortunate piece with, with this line is from Highway 55 up through Robbinsdale and into Brooklyn Park. It's going to run concurrent or run in the rail corridor. They own that line. They have um, higher property rights than anybody else in the country, including the state and including the counties. Those on the Met Council say they are dedicated to negotiating with the railroad and making sure this project moves forward. All of these projects that involve railroads make for difficult negotiations. But that just means you have to have the um, staying power to keep at it until you reach an agreement. And that's what we reinforce today is that we're going to have to have that staying power, but that we need that agreement and we're going to pursue it until we get it. At this point in time, there's not a date on when the project will break ground to begin construction. However, there was one clear takeaway from this meeting. The local cities have all, are all ready for this work to begin on the Blue Line. Shannon? All right, thank you, Meredith. The Golden Valley Fire Department is mourning the loss of one of their own. He's going to be missed. Um, he was a big part of our department, and there's a pretty big hole right now in, in our heart. Josh Richardson was a paid on call firefighter for 14 years with the Golden Valley Fire Department. His locker is now a makeshift memorial. Several bouquets of flowers are among his fire gear. The fire chief says he will miss Richardson's smile and uplifting spirit. Always positive, always thinking, always integrating with everybody that, uh, that we work with. Um, always a positive comment, uh, just, just an inspiration. He really brought that really positive feel good to the station. According to his Caring Bridge page, Richardson died Tuesday from stage four colon cancer. He was a seven year military veteran of the Navy and a member of Plymouth Covenant Church. He is survived by his wife and two children. Most of us have grown accustomed to the comforts of life indoors, but there's a slew of adventures you could do outside. In this week's edition of What I Learned at Summer Camp, Delane Cleveland introduces us to an adventure skills camp that's teaching a special group of kids about outdoor survival and much more. All right, are you ready to get started? At the Eastman Nature Center in Dayton. How do you think we're gonna build a shelter? It's the job of the naturalists to introduce kids to the wonders of the great outdoors. And this is a lot of bugs. Assuming that mother nature cooperates. It's a bit of a challenge. Usually the mosquitoes okay. are a bigger detriment, but they don't seem to be bothering everyone all that much today. Christina Palmisano is teaching this group of eager teenagers how to build a shelter out in the woods. All right, you got another one, Hayden? Using nothing but downed branches. If we were in a survival situation, we want to have a place to protect us from the elements so that's what we're working on right now. It's a valuable skill to have <laughs> if they ever happen to find themselves in that situation. Not sure considering that situation has never really come up. Yet while these activities are meant to expose kids to nature, there is something bigger at play. These kids are wonderful to work with. Each of these particular camp goers are on the autism spectrum. 
And the various activities they'll be exposed to this week will teach them much more than outdoor skills. So in the past, a lot of times, like kids like maybe with an autism spectrum would uh, register for a regular camp and they might have a hard time and struggle with both, you know, interacting with other kids in the camp and um, some of the sensory issues. But when they were around other kids on the autism spectrum, Kurt Adolfson says it's a more comfortable environment where they can develop their social skills. And so a lot of friendships are made at these camps and, and they are exchanging numbers by the end of the week and like planning on getting together. And some of the things we're finding are clear. It also helps that the kids are surrounded by adults who are supportive, understanding and encouraging. I found in my years of doing this camp that nature is a calming environment for people on the autism spectrum so it seems to go hand in hand and I've got very good feedback about the people who participate in this camp. Everybody else going to get in? This camp is now in its fifth year of teaching kids about nature and life. It's been a really fun and rewarding experience for me. In Dayton, Delaine Cleveland, CCX News. And finally, you don't have to wait until a festival to check out a food truck in Brooklyn Park. On several Tuesdays this summer, starting with July 16th, there will be food trucks open from 4 to 8 p.m. at the Community Activity Center. This is to complement the free music at the gazebo. The next events are on July 30th and then again on August 13th. And of course, you can keep up with events like these by checking out our website on a regular basis, ccxmedia.org. of hard work on the baseball diamond paid off for the Wyzetta American Legion Post. Post 118 started play last Friday as one of 96 teams hoping to reach the Gopher Classic Final. And they did, looking for their eighth win of the tournament facing New Ulm in the championship game. Top of the first inning, Wyzetta's Brendan Albert rips one to the gap in right center field. Keegan Nickel comes in to score and Wyzetta takes an early 1-0 lead. In the second inning, Nickel is at the plate and flies to center field. Deep enough to bring in Charles Engdahl on a sacrifice fly. And Wyzetta's up three to nothing in the second. Ben Leitner pitched six strong innings and is fired up about this strikeout to end the sixth as Wyzetta holds a four to three lead. And they break the game open in the seventh. Albert hits it hard past third and into the left field corner. That scores Nickel and Cullen Stamp to give Post 118 a 6-3 lead. And they aren't through. After a Connor Fletcher run scoring hit, Josh Gullickson singles, bringing home Albert from third base. Wyzetta scores five times in the seventh inning, and they win the Gopher Classic Championship for the third time since 2016, 9-3 the final to play nine games um, we won eight of those is just it's unbelievable um, especially having a lot of guys step up our pitching was phenomenal um, our hitting started off kind of shaky the first game and and now to have getting the hits and, and that is unbelievable we feel amazing um in pool play, you know, we took a tough loss to Harrisburg. But, you know, looking at Farmington in the Maple Grove game, we showed that we can bounce back and beat any team. And with the Excelsior game, we showed we can beat any team and become first place and champions. We're back on the golf course this week for our Ace in the Hole series, highlighting local courses in the area. This week, we head to Maple Grove to learn about a tough and long par 5 finishing hole. Rush Creek Golf Club in Maple Grove is one of the most challenging golf courses in the area for certain and even in the state and we have a challenging 18th hole to look at today. Aaron Jacobson is the PGA Director of Instruction out here and Aaron talk about number 18 and the challenges it provides right off the tee. Well you've got to hit three good shots in this hole starting with a great drive. Uh, this 569 yard par 5 can be had in two shots but you got to hit two great shots to get on the green in two. No matter which tee box you're playing from, Aaron, you're going to have a, a problem if you hit left or right, correct? Absolutely. we got OB to the right, all the way down the right side till the, the dog leg turns left, and then water down the left side and all the way around behind the green. Do your patrons uh, tend to like 18? 
Well, I, I hear a lot of stories about eights and tens on this hole, but I love playing it. It's a very good, challenging hole. You have to hit a good drive here. That's the key. Aaron, we're a good ways out here on the fairway, and this is a, actually a wide fairway despite the, the trouble you can get into on the left or the right on, off your tee shot, right? Absolutely. A great spot to aim when you're on the tee is the right side. There's a big hill over there. If you play it off the hill, you get a little more forgiveness. It kicks down, can help you avoid the water. Now, where we are, we're still 250 out, so you're kind of in between. If you're a long hitter, you can possibly go for the green, otherwise you can lay it up. But it is kind of an ultimate risk-reward hole, isn't it, for, for really good players? It is. It's a great risk-reward hole. You're either going to take it and lay up with probably a 7 or 8 iron out there for the longer hitters. You're going to have to get a 3-wood and place it up right side of the green out here. Tell us about the, the, the green itself and the approach coming in. Well, it's a tough approach. You know, you really want to avoid these bunkers that are on the right side of the fairway, you know, 60 to 80 yards out. Greenside bunkers aren't too bad, but avoid left and long on this hole with uh, either your second or third shot into the green. The green itself, though, is fairly large, right, by your course's standards? It is. It's uh, one of our larger greens, and you want to be on the right here. There's the right side or the left side. There's kind of a hump in the middle that if you're on one side or the other and you're on the correct side with the pin, it makes it much easier to putt. Aaron, thanks for taking time with us today out at Rush Creek. Yeah, you're welcome, John.